Did you know that Dracaena Wines now has a wine club? We named it the Chalk Club. Draco is on our label, but Vegas was getting a little jealous, so we decided he deserved to be our club spokes dog. In Las Vegas, betting chalk means that you are betting on all of the favorites. We are betting that we are one of your favorite wineries, so we thought the name was apropos. The club is simple, yet a bit different than most. When you wager on us, we will ship you three bottles of wine twice a year, once in April and once in September. You can choose all red or mix of red and rosé. You immediately receive 15% off of all your wine purchases throughout the year, but what makes our club stand out is the progressive discount. Let your club membership ride into the next year. Your discount increases. Each year you parlay your membership, you receive an additional 5% off up to a planned maximum of 25%. Your club shipments are discounted to a flat $15, plus we'll cover your club shipping cost for your second shipment. That's $15 house money in a sure bet for you. So please head to our website, dracinawines.com, and find out all of the benefits of joining the Chalk Club and how to sign up. We've stacked the odds so that you can get our award-winning wines without breaking the bank. Welcome to Dracina Wines Podcast. Our wines plus your moments equals great memories. I'm your host, Lori, and this is a podcast about all things wine. Hey, everyone. Thanks for tuning in to another episode of Dracaena Wines Podcast. For this episode, I posed a question to a group of fellow wine writers. What is the one wine you must have in your cellar at all times? So in other words, what's your go-to wine? The wine that when company comes over, you pull out first because you know that they are going to enjoy it. What's the wine that you have no problem pulling the cork on in the middle of the week? I didn't give them any more guidance other than that. They were free to choose whatever wine, whether it be red, white, rosé, or bubbles, and it could have been at any price point. They just were to pick the wine that they go back to vintage after vintage. Please note that one of the riders' dialogue was a bit staticky. I did my best to edit, but I am far from being an expert. Heck, I'm pretty far from being highly qualified or really qualified at any level. With that being said, I hope you enjoy the fun conversation. I hope that this becomes a monthly get-together with a rotating group of writers. So if you have a topic that you would like us to discuss, please shoot me an email at jersinawines at gmail.com. And if you wouldn't mind, please give us a five-star review so that others can find us. Slancha! Uh, not so much of a smooth start to the very first uh, Wine Writers Write-Up, but thank you everybody for joining. And um, my concept here is just to get a whole bunch of us together and just talk about some topic of wine and uh, obviously to all drink together. Um, so we're going to start off with introduction of our panel. And the first up is Jeff Eccles. He is a certified specialist of wine through the Society of Wine Educators. He is a blogger and the host of an award-winning podcast, We Like Drinking, that I do not miss a week of. These guys rock, and I love them. And just for you guys, smoked whale testicles. <laughs> <laughs> yes! <laughs> yes! Hey, thanks for having me on. It's uh, it's awesome to be here. I'm, I'm ready to drink. There we go. There we go. Next up is Rick Dean, and he is a wedding photographer by day and a wine blogger by night. He focuses on wine food, and food in Charleston, South Carolina, and the experiences there. And he enjoys learning about wine and sharing his perspective. Hey, everybody. It's, I'm really happy to be here, and uh, I started drinking a while ago so that I could be nice and ready for this so looking looking forward to it uh next up is john of tapachinos 
Vino, and he is an online wine real retailer. And him and his wife, Irene, founded it, and they specialize in importing and distributing wine from Europe and interesting wine regions in the U.S. The focus is on small family-owned producers with a dedication to making top-quality handcrafted wine. Hello. Hey, everybody. It's actually great to put uh, actually real faces to, to names. I've seen everyone's picture and on Instagram, and everybody looks completely different. Um, <laughs> Uh, uh, live and better, by the way, much better. Um, and, and many of the people on this um, on this uh, Google Hangout have actually bought one from us, so thank you. Um, and I hope when you guys taste it, you enjoy it. Awesome. And uh, well, I hope I look different and better since my picture <laughs> is of uh, Draco. <laughs> <laughs> your snout quite isn't quite as long as your your picture. <laughs> And I'm not quite as gray. I'm not quite as gray. Exactly. <laughs> uh, next up is my Fresno buddy, Nick. And he is a marketing and brand manager for two wineries in the Pacific Northwest. He began his career in wine down in Argentina, where he did marketing communications for a well-known Malbec producer. He holds an advanced... Uh, certificate in wine and spirits from the wine and spirit oh w set i now learned how i'm supposed to say that and that is, is currently yeah. in the diploma class um which whew, good luck Oof. <laughs> and 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 nick what nick he is super handsome awesome. and awesome <laughs> I didn't write that part, right? No, that's all me. That's me. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for having me. Of course, of course. And Debbie G. Quindo, the Hudson Valley Wine Goddess, is a certified wine specialist and wine location specialist in Port and Champaign. She has a background in travel, radio marketing, and community relations. She is also the author of Tapping the Hudson Valley, chairperson of the Hudson Valley Wine and Spirits Competition, which she graciously allows me to judge every year. And she is a co-owner of Happy Bitch Wines and my co-host on Wine for Bet Street, which is a free monthly wine education program. Thank you for uh, having me here tonight. I'm looking forward to drinking with all of you. Yeah, it's been a long time since I drank with you, Deb. <laughs> I know, 24 hours? 24 hours. <laughs> And if you are listening to this, I'm assuming you kind of already know who I am, but I am Lori and my husband and I, uh, my husband Michael and I own a boutique winery in Paso Robles. We specialize in producing award-winning Cabernet Franc. We are the founders of Cab Franc Day. And in addition to my microbiology background, I am a graduate in the UC Davis winemaking program. <laughs> so... Thank you, everybody, for joining, and I am so happy to be here with you guys and appreciative that you are taking your Monday evening um, or afternoon, depending on what time zone you're in, to be with us and to share your thoughts. Um, first off, all right, what's everybody drinking? <laughs> the most important thing. Debbie, you're all the way to the left in my camera, so you go first. Okay, so I've got... Kundi Sauvignon Blanc. Nice. Love it, love it. I call this my house wine because it's just easy drinking. It's Magnolia, it's, uh, Magnolia Lane, 2016, and I always keep their stocked in my house for company, especially a company that doesn't drink red wine. That's the first thing that I pull out. Awesome. Jeff? Yeah, so, you know, you got to have bubbles. You know? uh, and uh, so I like... You know, if, if I'm looking for something for every day or for something I can pull out any time, I like to go under 20 bucks if I'm talking about bubbles. And so for, for me, there's nothing better than a little Grue uh, out of New Mexico. Uh, they do a, a fantastic uh, uh, traditional methiad, and uh, I just think they hit it on hitting it on all cylinders all the time. That's awesome. Now, I'm not going to lie. I have never heard of them. Um, Debbie was oh, like, really? mm -hmm. I have. So, so I'm gonna have to They're keep really an eye. Good. I have to keep an eye out on them. My kind of go-to uh, bubbles 
is Chateau Saint Michel. Um, mm-hmm. They're you know, it's thirteen bucks. You can't you can't go wrong with thirteen bucks, and and it's always solid. It's always good, and I can savor the living daylights out of it. It's really good. <laughs> the, the Gruet is typically around seventeen or eighteen, probably depending on where you're at. But it's a great bubble. Uh-huh. Yeah. About 17. And they're, French. They're, they're from France, too. Yeah, so Gruet and Fee, if, do we want to talk about it now or do you yeah, want to talk about the history? Yeah, go ahead. So uh, Gruet and Fee is the French, uh, they're, they're actually in France. And, jeez, um, if I can remember his name, uh, Gilbert uh, was the founder of it. He came over to the United States, like in the uh, 50s, I think. And he found that there was other uh europeans making growing grapes down in new mexico and he had always wanted to do something over here and so in 1984 uh they started uh some plantings in in uh new mexico uh he sent his two of his kids over and said you guys are going to go make wine they do primarily uh it's usually a 70 percent chardonnay 75 percent chardonnay uh 25 percent pinot noir so kind of a classic uh blend their first release was 1989, uh, consistently 90 points, Wine Spectator. They've been in the top 100 uh, a couple times, I think. Oh, I've been they living under it. a rock. What's that? I said, I've been living under a rock. Yeah, I mean, I think I think in uh, sometime in the 90s, I think they sold a million bottles uh, in a year or something like that. I mean, you should be able to find this just about anywhere. Mm-hmm. Um, they do a rosé, they do a demi sec, they do a grand reserve, they do a grand brut rosé reserve, uh, and they've got a Sauvage uh, brand that's a no do- no dosage, uh, uh, completely dry as well as they do. So, wow, yeah, I'm gonna have to look them up. I, that seriously, under a rock, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> Woo! All right, John, what you got? I am drinking green tea today. Uh, nice. So this is, um, you know, we, we live really close, maybe an hour from green tea, an hour and a half on a, a bad driving day. And uh, I've never been to Livermore. I shouldn't say that. I've been to Livermore 3,000 times. I've never had wine uh, in Livermore. Um, so that's our next conquest. Um, we went to Lodi for the first time a few weeks ago in my snotty Napa Valley uh Attitude was eroded very quickly. We met some amazing wines and winemakers there. And so I'm going to get on the Livermore so I, I went out of my uh, cellar that a friend of mine had given me. And it's, it's drinking really nicely. It's really balanced. And um, it's not super restrained, but it's not super Napa Cabbie either. It doesn't jump out of the glass. I think it's just a great drinking uh, Cabernet. I'm, I don't have any food with me right now. And it's it doesn't feel overpowering, so I'm really impressed with it. And and it's, again, price-wise, it's about a third of the price of a of an average Napa cab. Um, so really impressive. Right. <laughs> yeah, they're they're solid. They they you know you're getting good stuff with them. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, Nick. So my kind of go-to, what I always keep in my cellar would be it's kind of a cheating. <laughs> But it's Malbec Terroir, so it is their line just above their Classico, so it's about nineteen ninety nine, um, and I keep it there. Well, one because it holds a special place in my heart, but also I love to taste people on it and see if they can guess what it is, and not a single person has ever guessed that it's Malbec. Um, it's, you know, grown up in the Valle de Uco, so really high. Uh, elevation, super fresh. You're not going to get that super extracted, um, you know, jammy, flabby, what people think of when they're drinking um, grocery store, you know, Malbec. So it's uh, it's really kind of a, a treat. But, you know, I stock up every time that it's available on the West Coast, which is rare. Under 20 bucks seems to be the hit, Under right? 20. Mine's 14.95 or something like that. Yeah, under 20 seems to be to be it. And I think it's kind of funny because Mike and I, when we first started getting into wine, like 20 bucks, we, you know, like we stood there and, you know, argued with each other. Should we, shouldn't we, should we, shouldn't we? And now, you know, 
Now, now we're, you know, 20 bucks. Yeah, give me whatever, you know, 20 bucks. I'll take three. Why not? <laughs> right. The bargain. Right. What's right. another 20? Yeah. Right. All right, Rick, what do you got? Well, I am drinking our, my go-to, which is a Gilheim. It's a French from Languedoc Rosé. This is the 2017 vintage. It just landed a few weeks ago. And because I live in the South here in Charleston, we really drink rosé 12 months out of the year. And I had the fortunate opportunity to go to this winery when I was in Languedoc a couple of years ago. And I fell in love with it. It's fresh and it goes with every season here in Charleston. Yeah, I like areas that are rosé all year. That's and it only it's 10.99. Oh, no, that's a real bargain. 10.99, a real bargain. I saw it for sale in Massachusetts and it was 12.99. So I mean, it's going to be below 15 pretty much anywhere you go. That's good. That's good. That's real that's real nice. Yeah. Um so my go-to um, for people who, who know me are probably going to keel over in shock that the bottle I'm going to lift up is not the bottle that they're probably thinking I'm going to lift up. Um, <laughs> so, Drum roll, please. So my go-to wine is Pine Ridge, Chenin Blanc, and Viognier. Good stuff. Hey. Yeah, that is a nice little bottle of wine. Yes. It, it is a great wine. You know, I always have it on hand. I always serve it um, when people come over, uh, you know, get them in the door, give them something that I know they're going to enjoy while other people are coming. Um, and when I first found this wine, it was like $9.99. And it is now vintage after vintage has creeped up and it is $14.99 now. Um, and when I was doing, when I was looking them up, they have like this wine, the Chenin Blanc Viognier actually has their own website now. So Pine oh, really? Yeah. So Pine Ridge has their wine for, you know, has their website for the Cabernet and all of that stuff. And then it, it is actually Pine Ridge CBV is what the website is for this particular wine. Is that a California wine? Yes. Yeah. And um, it's, they source it from all over, so it is legit California. Um, but. Uh, They're on the Silverado Trail. Right, right. They, um, they actually have, op they have vineyards all over now, which I'll get into in a little bit. Um, they have vineyards all over now, um, but they were originally um, right there on the Silverado Trail and now they've kind of sourced out but i'm guessing if that bottle has their own website that their that Got production it's on instagram too what oh yeah it's on instagram yeah and facebook holy cow yeah it's its own it's its own entity altogether um i'm gonna have to look for that down here i've never seen it oh really it's <clears throat> it's a goat it's it's a good wine now what i what i'm saying those who really know me um, probably would be assuming I was raising a bottle of Ferrari Carano Fumé Blanc <laughs> because I am the biggest stalker of, Fum of uh, Ferrari Carano there is. Um, but I thought I would go, you know, throw a little curveball into it. Um, but I don't know if you can see in the camera. Um, I haven't had this in a while and I poured it. And it's got bubbles. It's got some effervescent in there. And I don't remember it being effervescent in the past. So you guys who drink it, it, t it tastes fine and it smells fine. But it's got it's got a little petulance in there. It's got some bubbles. Right? Nobody... Has it been cons bubbling consistently since you poured it? Um, well, this is... No. Um... This has been sitting for a little bit. This this glass is what's left of what was poured before we got on, so about 40 minutes ago. Okay. And there's there's a few bubbles in there, but not, you know. So they they okay. are dissipating. 
but there are still some bubbles in there. Um, it's still good, but um, I thought it was interesting. The price the price keeps going up and up and up, um, so I more and yeah, more I, people are finding them. I don't think I've had anything but that from Pine Ridge, honestly. Yeah. Right. No, I haven't either. In fact, when I went to go look them up, I was like, oh, they make, they're known for Cabernet? I don't know that. <laughs> I, I don't think so. <laughs> not in my house or not. <laughs> no, like, All right, if you say so, if you say so, you know. Um, but uh, so, so I'll start just about them. Um, so they actually started in 1978, and they're in the Stagsley District, um, and they're known for the, the vineyard is actually really pretty, uh, not that I saw it live, but there's all pine trees along the terraced vineyards. So that is where they're getting their name from. Um, but now they're all over. They're in Howell Mountain, Oakville, Rutherford, Carneros. Um, but they do, um, they are sustainable. They are certified Napa Green. Uh, so I'm always, I always like it when I like a wine and they're certified that way, you know, um, absolutely. And, uh, you know, it's just a little bonus in, in my eyes, you know, I don't know. How do you guys feel about, about being certified, sustainable or organic? Personally, I think it's, it's nice, but from the winery side, it's kind of a pain. So as long as they're doing, you know, things that are, you know, can be considered organic or sustainable. Um, I don't care if they go through the, the red tape of getting that certification. Anybody, would anybody buy a wine specifically because they are or not because they're not? No, like it, it doesn't affect my decision making at all. I uh, just want to know that they're taking care of the earth. Yeah, I mean, I like to see it. Um, and I, I always like it when I find somebody is, you know, performing sustainability in their practice. Uh, but I would not, my decision would not go one way or the other based on any of that. You know, it's interesting. We were at, uh, we were in Oregon back in November and we were staying at Youngberg Hill. Um, and we bought some of the wines which are now on our website and we spent a few days with their winemaker and I asked him if they were organic and he said he actually is. Uh, practice is organic, but not certified because certified organic is worse than um, some of the other practices they could use. So, for example, sulfur, you can dump sulfur in the vineyard uh, and sulfur is poison. And they actually, their house is surrounded by the vineyards. His children all live there. They're all under 18. He's got a couple of dogs. He has cows uh, on the property. And his point of view was, I'd rather put something non-organic uh, in the vineyard that would violate the certification than actually be organic and dump poison toxic sulfur uh, and ruin my children or my, my livestock or my pets. So um, for me, it's it's more about, like Rick said and others have said, um, you take care of your land. Are you expecting that property to be around 100 years from now? Um, you know, are, are you, you know, people who use Roundup and spray poison, you know, that's a whole different story. But I think organic and natural has... Um, has as many faults and, and detractors and detractions as, as anything else does. And you know, as a winemaker, it can be limiting. You know, and there's times where you have to make decisions uh, to to save your crop or to to fix. You know, if if something's going wrong, you may have to do something to the wine to try to correct it. And if you're bound by these rules to have this label on your bottle of wine not to mention the price tag that you have to pay to be able to get those, that little label on your bottle. You know, if you're a winemaker, you need to do your job. And to me, that certification doesn't trump the work that you need to do. Right. I, I agree with that. And I, I, I mean, people have such issues with certain things, you know, like sulfur is like, Oh, you know, the end of the world with sulfur, you know, and it's people, people don't really understand what it does and how how it works you know it's it's media you know it's um you know they're blowing this huge issue um and they're not really understanding what it does um but you know, it was, go ahead nick that point i i would agree with you laurie i think that it's great that young Burkill 
doesn't use it. Um, you know, where I work, we, we don't um, as well. But powdery mildew is a big issue in Oregon. And if you're having to deal with it, sulfurs, I mean, yes, I might not want to live right next to a vineyard sprayed with sulfur, but sulfur, technically, it's a natural chemical and it's allowed in organic you know, winemaking. And so I, I don't have a problem if it's, if I don't have to, I guess, live in it and breathe it every day, but. Right. You know, to me, again, if you, if you are taking care of the earth around you in a responsible way, there are, you know, we we all can spend many hours, you know, looking for organic apples or organic bananas or organic wine. And sometimes it matters and sometimes it doesn't. Here, I think it's a lofty goal. And maybe it will be it is beneficial for that particular winemaker, but if you are not um, taking care of the, your land and taking care of your you know your winemaker and your people, then it's going to show in the types of wines that you're producing, in my opinion, and it'll eventually come back to bite you. I agree, Deb. What do you think? Well, I think you know. You have to do what you have to do to put out a good product. I don't think, you know, the whole biodynamics and sustainability, I think you, you need that because I think just because you're growing something, whether it's grapes, potatoes, I mean, you have to put back into the earth what you're taking out too. Right. So you really have to respect, respect it. Um, is it, do I go out of my way? Does it bother me if someone is or isn't? Not really. You know, I have to like it. I, you know, I prefer somebody that I, I know is taking care of the environment. There's, I mean, you know, so many people in years past coming up to where we are now have not. So we are paying for that in many different ways where we have to start taking care of the environment other, you know, to leave it to the next, you know, generations thereafter. So if you were, if, if you liked your bottle of wine, whatever, but for them to go organic or sustainable, they upped it a buck because it's probably not going to be up to that much. Would you pay that buck for that? Absolutely. 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 So, Jeff, I think it was... Just because somebody is sustainable and biodynamic doesn't mean their cost of producing a, a product is less expensive than somebody else's. No. In fact, it's you know, really not... It, the production, when you're certified like that, probably is much a more. little... It, it, well, I'm not sure how much the... Because we're not... Um, I'm not sure how much <laughs> um, additional your wine. additional it is. Oh, um, I'm not buying your stuff anymore. Yeah, right. Now. But and <laughs> you know, and God, Mike would like go ballistic on me because I am like I am a tree hugger. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> I am a tree hugger. Um, but uh, it's you know, there's just certain things you just you you know, I don't think the production is so much more money, but the regulation and the document, and Nick, you probably, you know, the documentation that goes along with getting that certification and yeah. maintaining that certification and changing the facility to fit the specifications. That's where the money is, not in the Absolutely. wine making. Yeah. No, nope, not at all. It's all in that. It's all in getting that label. It's not in what you're putting in the bottle. I mean, you're putting a great wine into a bottle. You're taking care of the earth. I, I'm speaking to you, Lori. I mean, oh, okay. you're taking you're taking care of things, right? So having the certification or not is not going to determine whether or not, or not your customers purchase your wine. It to me, it's you're a responsible winemaker. So that's what's right. important. Right. And, and we do, we try, we do everything we can and, you know, we do as much as you can, but there's no way I would ever see myself going through that rigmarole because there's enough 
there's enough yeah. red tape and paperwork and everything for everything else um, to to do that. Um, but I get how a lot of wineries want to do it so that um, they stand out from others. But my, that was why I was asking that question is, is you've got, you know, this, this Merlot and this Merlot, they both got, you know, 92 in Wine Spectator. This one is, you know, organic certified and bio, you know, uh, certified. And this is not same price, everything. Do you pick this one because everything else is equivalent, but they're bio? I pick both and I would do a comparison. I pick the one that tastes better. <laughs> yeah. And just because they're both 92s doesn't mean I'm going to like either one of them. That, oh, that, see, that's another good, see, that's a good question yeah. for a write-up right there for, for exactly. Wine Writers Roundup there is. You know, I will tell you, at one of the wine stores that I go to frequently here in Charleston, this was many, many years ago. We walked in and I, she, the owner of this store knows her customers. And I walked up to a bottle of wine that on it, I'm going to out myself here and say, I liked the label. Okay. Nothing I'm wrong just, with that. Nothing wrong noticed, with that at I all. I liked the label. I picked up the bottle of wine and the wine store owner saw it and she said, is that for you or is that for Gary? And I said, it's for me. And she said, then put it back. You will hate it. And mm -hmm. I said, yeah, but I read about it and it got this huge score. She goes, I'm telling you, put it back. Because you're going to hate it or buy it for Gary and then taste it. And you'll see that I was right. <laughs> and she was absolutely right. I hated the wine. It was not my palate type. It was not my preferences. It was everything about a wine that I typically didn't like at that point in time in my life. Um, and it had this outrageous score that didn't mean anything to me. Right. I get it. I get it. Um, so let, let's go back to what um, initially I was thinking in terms of uh, what your wine is. Debbie, do you want to talk about the winery a bit? You got any info on them? Sure. Um, let me pour myself some first. Absolutely. Can't talk about it with an empty glass. I know. I know. Oh, no, no, no. I'm sure Debbie has emptied the glass. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm like, I'm doing this really wrong if that's what we're supposed to be yeah, doing. I, I came home, had a glass. I'm going to have to go back for another bottle here in a minute. <laughs> this, this is my third. Don't, um, so, <clears throat> Cody was, I'll tell you how I got introduced to it. It was a winery. Um, went out to California for a friend of mine's wedding. Um, she, uh, we went to her house, we got off the plane, went to her house, she packed us with a picnic basket and sent us on our way. And she said, you have to go to Kundi. So it was Paul and I go up to snow, but we go to Kundi. And um, we really liked it. And obviously they're Sauvignon Blanc. So it was just one of those wines that grew on us and I just love it. And people that come, you know, that's our house, um, our house, uh, our house white, I guess I would say. So Kundi's been around for a really long time. I don't know if any of you have been up there to uh, Kundi. Why uh, ago. Yeah, it's right by, I hate to say, it's right by where the fires were. Um, but uh, That doesn't really have, narrow it down. Yeah, that's <laughs> true. That's a pretty big um, plot. Um, they have an awesome, awesome cave. Really, really cool cave. But um, Louis Kundi immigrated here from Germany. And... Um, he purchased what was called the Wildwood Vineyards Ranch, and it's on um, red volcanic soil. And it was actually first planted in 1879 by John Rummen, who imported cuttings from Chateau Margaux and Lafitte Rothschild. So as life gone on, when he passed away, it was taken over by his sons, and then um, a couple of his sons were drafted. But... Um, even today, it's still within the family, I believe. Um, fifth or sixth generation, they have, um, let me see how much they have. I think a thousand, a thousand acres parcel. Wow. And within their, their whole 
um, parcel that's around their vineyard or around, you know, the tasting room, whatever area, they all have different micro microclimates within it. So it's kind of really cool. Um, their bonded winery number 202. Um, anything else? Which means what? That means that they were the 200. And second winery, winery to be bonded, bonded with in, in California. Okay. I mean, they have a great, um, I don't know if you did the mountaintop tasting, but they have a tasting at yeah. 1,800 1, feet with these sick views of, of Sonoma Valley. Um, they usually pour a couple of lights and the rest reds, and they take you on a very long tour um, in sort of a weird Jeep type vehicle. And it's uh, it's a real blast. It's about 50 bucks, um, but just a lot of fun on a beautiful summer day. It's it's so cool out there, both cool. like fun school, cool. it's also a weather vehicle, vehicle, and it's uh, yeah. Just, just real, just a blast. Yeah, all those different micro or macro climates, I guess, yeah, yeah. Um, within the whole vineyard and everything, which really makes it pretty unique. All right, Jeff. And they have good red wines too. I mean, their their whole their whole portfolio is is, is pretty is pretty good. Jeff, do you have more on uh, this wine that I've never heard of? That apparently I'm the only one on the face of the uh, earth who hasn't. Um. <laughs> You know, not a lot. They've got they've got uh, uh, facilities in Santa Fe and Albuquerque, uh, New Mexico. A beautiful, you know, green, lots of green apple, lots of minerality, uh, just a beautiful nose. Um, just, I just really enjoyed this uh, this bottle of uh, bubbles. I, I have to honestly say, I don't think I would. I don't. My brain doesn't go to New Mexico for for grapes. For I mean, I you know, I know it's there, but I don't really. It's not in the forefront of my brain. To... You don't think of it as a Pinot, uh, Pinot Noir uh, uh, safe haven. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I think I think uh, when you're there, you, I, I, you know, I don't know exactly how it works because I agree. You think of New Mexico as more of like, you know, the Arizona desert, you know, or, yeah. or uh, but it may have something to do with altitude um or just with how they grow their grapes i don't know what kind of uh you know canopy management they use uh but and it's also bubbles so you know they're able to blend then it sits on leaves for you know generally with these are two years on leaves before they're going to be uh, uh, releasing them you know so there's some there's some work that the winemaker can do to to get it right uh, but he found the conditions he wanted in in New Mexico, and uh, you know I've had uh, Vivac uh, out of New Mexico. They do some fantastic wines. Uh, I've had other wines from New Mexico, and there there are some really good wines coming out of uh, New Mexico. So, well, and keep in mind that in New Mexico you've got some really um, you know skiable mountains. I mean, so yeah, the mountains. And they've got the desert. So yeah. somewhere in between all of that, you're going to have this opportunity to grow grapes. Yeah, there's good there's good altitude out there that they can use exactly. with. And, you know, when you're looking at that kind of environment as well, you're talking huge potential diurnal shifts uh, that are going to allow that sugar to come up during the daytime. But then that sugar is going to plummet and that acidity is going to rock it up at night. You know, so you've got... You've got some play there with the grapes and what they're going to be able to do and how they're going to be able to struggle and, and you know, what they can produce. And because it's New Mexico, you're going to get it at seventeen or eighteen ninety nine. <laughs> exactly. Thirty ninety nine because it's coming from California. <laughs> now, Jim, did, did you have some – you had a New Mexico winery, people? Yeah. Um, we like drinking, right? Yeah, Viva, Vivac uh, mm -hmm. Winery. Uh, we had them on. Uh, Michelle, uh, they had some. Oh my God, they had so, some fantastic wines that we were drinking on the show. They 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 shared it with us for everybody on the show, and uh, just some beautiful stuff that they're producing there. I couldn't. I was really surprised by it because it was a lot of reds. Um, there was I can't even remember the name of. There's a grape I'd never even heard of before. Something out of Italy that they found grow grew really well in their environment but they're talking uh, a much higher elevation uh than you know what most of us are using are, are used to i think you know over six thousand feet possibly 
as far as what they're growing grapes in. Oh, wow. wow. Holy cow. Now I'm going to have to go look it up because they're probably, I'm probably about to get an email. <laughs> yeah. Oh, they're, they are on live chat. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, so John, what do you, what do you got for us? What, what winery, uh, info you got for us? At first I have to say I have a microphone envy from Jeff. That is a, that is a well, you gotta be careful what you ask for because that microphone attacks. So sure. yes, it does. Yes, it does. <laughs> but anyway, impressive, I will say. Um, so, you know, just to put things into perspective, I think, so we talked about bonded winery 208 or 288 or whatever it was. So when he was 202. 202. When he's like eight something, 860, uh, and they were bonded in 1883. So one of us to the first winery in California bonded in 1857. Um, Good Luck Bunch was bonded in, in 1858. They were number two. So whenever Kunde came on, they were two, whatever you say, two away. Uh, and then we have eight something Wednesday. So Wednesday claims to be the, lo the longest operating, uh, never closed family winery uh, in the United States. So they didn't close for prohibition. They weren't destroyed by phylloxera uh, in the 1800s. So they've been making wine for a very long time. Most of that wine was bulk wine uh, sold to um, companies like Gallo and, and so forth in the early days. They made a little bit of their own wine. I think it's really in the last 30 years where they have started producing wines, significant amounts of wine on their own label. Um, still, if you look at their impressive list of my employees, it's uh, Wenty, Wenty, Wenty everywhere. I mean, uh, just like it is at Kunde, just like it is at, um, uh, at I think it mostly it's the Bunchus, not the Gunlocks that are running around at Gunlock Bunchu. Um, but they've managed to keep the family uh, in the winery operation. So I think they're on a fourth generation uh, winemaker uh, right now. So really impressive winery. I think we were talking about prices. I don't buy a lot of $20 wine because I live in Napa. Um, <laughs> When we first moved here, we were drinking a lot of Spanish wine because that's what we grew up on, and $20 is a really decent Spanish wine. We had so so much sticker shock the first two years. We went places, and you know, a really average cab might be 80 or 90 and 100. Then after a while, two years later, we were like, oh, that cab's 70 bucks. I wonder what's wrong with it. Um, <laughs> And uh, so that's the that's the sort of the, the bad thing that happens to you. And then people would tell us about Washington Cab, and we would laugh, and then we would taste it and think, oh my God, it's just as good as anything else. And that's what I feel about this Wednesday wine. Obviously, they've been doing it for 130 years or so. Um, they've been doing it in the same family, uh, in the same set of traditions. Um, they have a region that that it is. They have great soil there. Um, it's also a region that, that has the diurnal shifts that Jeff was talking about, where it gets really hot uh, during the day, but because they're in that valley, it also gets really cool at night. Um, so that actually has a really good benefit. They have a tremendous amount of wind uh, that blows through there. So it, it creates a dynamic, I think, that's, uh, that's really unusual. So um, I'm going to run down to a little bit more sometime this spring. Um, if you guys want to get to know Kent and Robin from uh, Appetite for Wine, they were there this last weekend. and um, and they were we raved about it, and they posted some great pictures and, and some stuff on Facebook and Twitter. I've got to get down there because the wine is um, is really high quality, but it looks like the tasting experiences are what Napa used to be maybe 25, 30 years ago, where it's relatively inexpensive, but really open, where you get to meet the winemaker, um, and those are the kind of experiences we really like. I've been to Wednesday. It's yeah. Really, it's, yeah, I went to a, actually, I went to a concert there. Cool. Who'd you see? Yeah, right. So that. What did I see? I saw Ario Speedwagon, and then me and Ario Speedwagon, the band member, went and tasted in the tasty room. You were tasting yeah, with the Ario Speedwagon. I huh? was tasting with, yeah, Kevin Cronin, and yeah, Dave, and yeah. Nice. Okay, I'm reaching yeah. out to touch you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't think that's how the internet works. <laughs> uh, well, well, well. <laughs> I have pictures. I have to dig them up. Yeah, we all have pictures. It's just what we're using them for. <laughs> so, so my brain automatically goes right to Friends because it's on TV all the time, and I like can do every episode of it. Uh, but that just made me think of the episode where they went to go see Hootie and the Blowfish. 
Uh-huh. Right? And they're like, is that a hickey? Who did that? That would be the work of a blowfish. Um, so Debbie? No, I, um, was Paul I'm with you? No. <laughs> My girlfriend's from California I was with. Speaking of, of Hootie and the Blowfish, do any of you know which member of Hootie and the Blowfish is part owner in our winery? Darius Rucker? It's the only name I know. That's, I was yeah, going to say that. Name. I don't even know his name. The other it's guy just, with the long hair and the thing? Yeah. <laughs> long, long hair that never has long hair and the thing i don't know but um it's the bass guitarist he yeah. actually i just went to a wine tasting and he's part owner of and they're in um sonoma county actually oh yeah. there's there's quite a few rockers train train has their own wine yeah. now and yeah. i saw i saw train and hootie together um and sat next to uh hootie sat next to darius's mother <laughs> Oh, there you go. <laughs> yeah, uh, the, I think it's the lead singer from Tool has a winery down yep. in Arizona. Yeah, and uh, yeah, there's a there's a lot of there's a lot of them. You know, they they they've got that money, and you know. I was just gonna say you gotta do something with the money, buy a winery. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I got I got to bring it back because I got to see if you guys know it. So uh, the Vivac Winery I was talking about for before. So Aglianico, theirs is spe spectacular. But then the one I'd never heard of or had before was a Rafosco. I don't know if you guys have heard of that grape before, but I had never heard of it. I heard uh, just that. You did really? Who, who was making it that you had it? Um, uh, uh, Mathiason. Oh, really? Okay. Just yeah. saying. Him and I, college together. Yeah. Nice. So this that was the first one I'd ever had, um, and it was – of all the wines we tried that night, the Rafusco was by far my favorite. Such an interesting, interesting wine. Nick, are you, you're uh, you're studying now, so you know that one. You know, I, I have not tried one before. No. no. My, my brain is like, I'm ready to explode. Right now. <laughs> <laughs> Stop naming like grape varietals. Like... Aww. I feel I, mean, I feel bad for you. I really do. You sent me that connection. you sent me that piece of paper, and I'm like, nope, I'm done. Nope, we're done. Right. <laughs> uh, and you're going you're going you're going for level three, is that right? Which or which what are you going? Yeah, diploma. Oh, diploma. Oh my word. <laughs> yeah. Hey, I don't know if you guys saw that. Uh, you guys know that uh, Amber and Dave from uh, formerly Napa Food and Vine now Wine Travel Eats. They're in London, and they just took the. WSET one and their their description of the the exam, I feel like I should, wouldn't even need to study for it and, and go in and and pass it. It's like questions like which of these is the red grape variety? It's like Sauvignon Blanc, Albarino, something and Cab. Bosco. Watch that when I take it, that'll be on the exam. <laughs> Yeah. You're gonna go. I didn't even know that was a grape. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right, Nick. What about your your guy? Your your special wine? All right. So again, Altos Las Hormigas. Um, you say that so fair. well. Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, I probably say it really well just because that's the winery that I actually cut my teeth on, uh, working in the industry. I'm moving down to Argentina. Uh, founded in 1995 by Antonio Moriscalchi and Alberto Antonini. Um, Alberto Antonini is a famous Italian winemaker who uh, does consulting uh, around the world, even like Segesio and Sonoma. He's their consulting winemaker. Um, let's see, the name Altos Las Hormigas, it used to be Altos Las Medrano, which is the town where the actual bodega is at. But uh, when they planted the vineyard, all these little ants started to eat the baby vines. So, uh, and all the field workers basically said that the ants owned the land. Um, so what they did is they uh, spread little ashes, little ant ashes around the vineyard to kind of detract them. Uh, at which point, once the... Wait, 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 wait. Ant ashes? Like what? they burned ants and spread their ashes, like, you in a burial? Can, you can actually purchase, like, yeah, ash of uh, little insects.
insects to, to trap insects. It's natural. It's organic. Look, they're organic. <laughs> it's organic. It's um, like a warning, right? It's like a warning. Yeah. Exactly. And so. Saying it's organic, Nick. That's okay. We're going to go with it. <laughs> um, but that is how they decided to change the name to Altos Las Hormigas because the ants really own the land there. Um, so they have the couple vineyards down in the Lujan de Cujo area, but then um, up in the Valle de Uco, we're talking 4,000 to 6,000 feet elevation, uh, vineyards in the Altamira, Vista Flores, and Gualtajari area. That's where uh, Gualtajari, Chupangado area is where this particular wine uh, comes from. Um, a lot less of the limestone soils that they particularly uh, like to use. Um, it's more gravel, so free draining, but um, the vintage that I'm drinking right now, first time I've actually had this vintage, it's 15, um, tastes a little young right now, and that's because they actually harvested about 15 days earlier, um, and that's because the heat in December Jan and January was super hot, and they're trying to go away from that extracted jammy -ness. Um So they picked early. Uh, it's really coming together. Nice, you know, red fruit, uh, bright acid. Not, again, not what you expect from a Malbec. And um, one thing I love about Argentinian Malbec, especially from smaller producers or ones that you can actually find there and not here in uh, the States, it's like a $20 bottle drinks like a $40 bottle. $50 bottles, you're getting, you know, something equivalent to California $100 bottle. And so uh, this was aged 50% in concrete, no, stainless steel, 25% uh, in concrete, and 25% uh, in pudra. Oh, and they use Pedro Parra, who is a terroir specialist who travels around the world digging soil pits and working with wineries to talk about their soils. So, you know, when they talk about uh, their terroir, they know what they're talking about. So that's my shameless plug for a winery that I love. Near and dear. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> love it. Hey, Nick. Oh. All right, Rick, what you got? All right. Well, like I said, I'm drinking the, the Melinda, Melinda Gasach Gilheim Rosé. This is... It's a mouthful. It is a mouthful. The, it, the name of the winery is Mas du... Dumas de Gassac. It's the Gassac Valley in the Languedoc. And if you're picturing France, folks, you know, you've got Provence over to the west or to the east, and you've got Languedoc over to the west um, that actually go bounce, butts up against Spain. And this winery is not that, you know, they're kind of like right at in the at the beginning of Languedoc. So when we were staying um, in Provence, it was just an hour's drive over there. The first vines were grown in this in this valley in the eighth century. So there have been vines growing in this area uh, for centuries, of course. Charlemagne was involved in making sure that they were well taken care of, et cetera. But we're going to fast forward from the 8th century all the way up to the 1970s when um, Ami Iber or Gilbert, Iber in France, French, and Gilbert in English, bought the land. He and his wife bought the land. They were looking to slow life down. He was a, a, a leather tanner, um, bought the land, and fortunately for him had a friend who – was a geologist, a well-known geologist in, in France, um, and he came and studied the soil and said, you have to buy this farm um, and you have to plant grapes because this soil has property, you know, it's glacial properties that um, they wish they had in Bordeaux, making some of the best you know, Grand Cru Bordeaux, Bordeaux um, in France. And so they bought the farm and immediately started uh, planting grapes. They brought in some grapes 
some varietals from Bordeaux, and they make excellent, excellent wine. But the thing about this particular wine that we like so much is it's classic French rosé. It's crisp. It's 50% Syrah, 50% Carignan, which is not the typical provincial rosé. But this, I mean, it's it's bright. Um, it's got flavors of strawberries and melon and Asian uh, hair. And it just works all year long for us. But it's hot here all year long, pretty much. Um, and... You know, it doesn't hurt that when you travel thousands of miles and you get to go to the winery and you're walking in their fields, you tend to get an affection for them. Um, and at a 10.99 price point, it's something that is very easy to just have in your cellar um, and drink it throughout the year. Um, we had just finished our 2016 vintage about a month ago. And so we had a little bit of a lag. We were, you know, what I was saying, we were drinking rosé remnants that we could find in our cellar. And, uh, and cellar means one of many uh, wine freezer or refrigerators that we have. Um, but, uh, it, it's a great wine. They're great people. Um, and, uh, for every day, I love 1099. Ten ninety nine is good. Yeah, yeah, beat that. Yeah, that's uh, that's 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 a six pack. That's a case right there. Ten ninety nine. <laughs> Honestly, I don't know how they make it and sell it so that we can buy it for so little. Yeah, ah, that... it baffles me. It absolutely baffles me. I mean, I'm I can close my eyes and picture their seller. I can picture their tanks and how are they selling this to us for 10.99? We don't know, but it's great. Isn't it always like baffling you between the cost of the bottle, the cost of labor and everything, how the price well, is. Let me tell you it does. from, from our end, from our end, I, it blows my mind when I see a 7.99 or a 10.99 bottle in a store because there's absolutely no way I can get anywhere near that, you know? And then when it's shipped and, you know, coming from imported on a container ship. Right. right. And, come on. and John, now, you know, that aspect of it, the importing of it, like, I mean, how long, when, when you take a wine from out of the country, how long is that in, um, I'm blanking on the word. Blanking on the word of uh, customs, whatever. Customs. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> customs. Like. We'll clear, we'll clear customs is usually the same day, but um, the the wine. So we have to go from the winery to a port. So for example, our our Croatia wine has to drive all the way around Croatia through Venice down the coast to La Spezia. That's that's five hundred bucks for for one pound. Um, then the wine has to get on a giant container ship that comes to New York. That's a grand for one pallet. Then it's, believe it or not, the truck, thank you, unions, the truck from New York to California, that's another grand. Um, so when I look at, I was at Whole Foods the other day and I saw something go blanc from France for four ninety nine, and I almost tipped over the display. I was like, this is, <laughs> this is absolute bullshit. It's not fair. Yes. Okay, said, that was France, by the way. That was France. Okay. Just, just bleep it. You know, just bleep it. So, so, so I, I think about, like, I know that it costs me about $3 and something a bottle uh, for the entire shipment on a pallet. Now, these guys are shipping more than a pallet. But, but four ninety nine, honestly, it, my guess is they shipped it in bulk in a giant bladder somewhere on a ship where uh, it was probably $0.30 cents, um, uh, to ship the wine, and then they rebottled it in the United States, a lot of these wines. I don't think anything under $10 um, can be can be a quality bottle um, with with non bulk shipment um, just because it's impossible. I mean, just the taxes uh, that are paid per gallon, just the taxes and excise and duties that when you enter the United States, it seems unlikely uh, to make it. Um, so I, you know, it, it's frustrating for us because you know I can't get a wine 
from Italy that I buy, I buy for four dollars. I can sell it for less than about fifteen, just for the cost of getting it here. Um, so when I see a nine dollar wine, I think, my God, what, you know, what am I missing? What do they have to do to get it there? Yeah, exactly. Now sometimes it's scale, right? So if if you're seven selling a thousand uh, cases, uh, or two thousand cases, or five thousand cases of some wine. Then, then maybe it's thirty or forty cents a bottle, but still a four ninety nine Sauvignon Blanc is is pretty hard to, to fathom uh, where where that price could have come from. Even for people who don't have to pay a mortgage on the property because their family's owned it for a thousand years, and I mean just the cost of production has got to be more than four dollars. So that's interesting. That's really interesting, John. Um, so Rick, on your wine, does it does it say anything about if it was bottled, uh, you know, on location, or does it have any kind of information about where it was bottled? It was bottled in France. Yeah, it was. Okay. Yeah, it was absolutely bottled in France. I mean, we were in their facility, which is, you know, in an old mill. Um, it, it, it's astonishing to me that it can be sold for so little. So, I mean, and 1099 used to be, you know, you know, if you if you go look back in my wine life, you know, there was a time when 799 was, oh, I'm not paying any more than that. Right. And then it was 1099. Well, now it's, you know, it's whatever I want. And it's not because I, you know, am rich. It's because I value what's in the bottle. And this... I will, I, you know, I know that if I'm looking at a 499 Sav Blanc, I don't care where it's from or a, you know, 699 grocery store wine. I'm not, you know, I'm just not going to buy it. But thankfully in the, in my case, this particular wine, it's like, I understand its entire provenance from vineyard to my, to my home. And that's just quite a, I mean, it's a value that unfortunately for you, John, stinks. It does stink. I'll tell you, how many of you guys were at the Wine Bloggers Conference and went to the Carinina um, tasting? Um, me, 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 so me, one, me. I was, I was there. Yeah, so as someone that grew up, my mother would only drink Rioja wine. So, you know, we, we didn't drink a lot of, uh, even like Roberto del Duero was like prohibited in our house until uh, very, fairly recently. And so when I tasted the Carignano wine, I was thinking, this isn't going to be able to hold up. But I'll tell you, the the relative quality of the, the Garnacha and the Carignano, the 100-year vine, vine wine, which retails in the U.S. for like 25 bucks, all the way down to the entry-level wine, which is $9. I'll tell you what, I'm, I'm in love with the Garnacha right now, and 9 bucks is pretty damn good. And there wasn't a wine in that tasting, and there was, I think, six wines we tasted that I wouldn't have. On a, on a Tuesday night or a Monday night or Wednesday night. They're not all Saturday night or Friday night wines. They're eminently drinkable, and I think the cheapest one of them goes for nine ninety nine, which means that it was probably purchased at the wine every for a dollar uh, a bottle. Um, so that's incredible. That's incredible. absolutely incredible. Yeah. So, so Rick, I, I'm going to go, I'm going to springboard off of what Jeff was, I think, getting at. What when you flip that bottle around, mm -hmm. what what does it say? Does it say cellared and bottled by, produced and bottled by? Is that where you were going, Jeff? Or <clears throat> yeah, it was. Yeah. Because I mean, I know they may bottle on premise, but for what they ship to the U.S., it may they may bulk ship it and then it gets bottled here. Right. It says bottled in France. It's in French. It's saying it in French, and I know enough French to know what the word bottle is. Um, but it was bottled in France. That's so so that, that just means that it costs about a dollar, a dollar bottle, uh, maybe a dollar fifty a bottle for the uh, for the importer who, who paid for it at that level and then paid for the shipping and then put their big fat margin on it and, and selling it for ten ninety nine. It's amazing, by the way. I can hear that. I don't I don't put calls at it. I just I just think it's, it's amazing, and there's there's a, some level of power of scale. So they can't be bringing just a few cases of this, so they're bringing a oh, lot of it, yeah. so they're getting the benefit of scale. Yeah, yeah. It's just, and actually, I mean, to, to that point, John, the wine shop 
that I buy from, when she purchases the wine every year, she's buying a pallet just for her store. Just for her store. Wow. So how many yeah. other stores are buying a pallet just for their store in the States? So they might have half that container ship. Exactly. Exactly. I mean, I, I know that when I was up in, on the Cape and I walked into this wine store and the entire front end cap was all this wine. And I was like, what are you? Oh, my God. I can't believe you have this. And they were like, well, yeah, we buy a pallet every time it comes in because well, it's so good. Well, and it's it's flip glass. It's screw cap. So, you know, the cogs on it are going to be a lot less than, you know, anything else. Great point. True. Great point. Right. I will say the, um, the one of our producers in Croatia, they make one barrel of wine every year, which is, as you guys know, about 25 cases. So we, we have an annual negotiation now where we negotiate how many bottles we're going to get, not how many pallets or cases, because they can't even fill up a half a pallet. So none of our producers produce enough wine um, and because they're mostly small family producers, if they get wiped out one year, the weather sucks a different year, something else happens with mold or mildew or, or shatter or something, you know, they'll say, hey, last year I know I gave you 50 cases, but this year I've only got 10. Um, so we're kind of dancing around, uh, filling up pallets sometimes with, I've got literally, uh, I'll have six bottles of something and then 60 bottles of something and 150 bottles of something else. Um, and the only reason we've been able to survive, I think, some some months is that we have the U.S. production where I can just drive up to Oregon with a with my big SUV and, and, and pack in my Vidon and my Youngberg and, uh, and my Ghost Tail and, and my Sass and the other wines and bring them down here myself. And I don't have to worry about that really long trip, um, you know, from Europe that takes almost a month. Um, I can be up and back in 48 hours. But that's one of the things that you do that so many other wine uh, retailers don't do is you're you're looking for the small producer, the family, the family producer. And the fact that you're looking in Croatia, um, to me, that was incredibly appealing. And I don't know whether any of the Croatians wines that I just recently bought from you or any of that from that segment that you know only makes that little bit. But, all of them, all of them. But the, but, the thing, but the reality of that is is that there are very few stores in most American cities where you can walk into and find Croatian wine. And if you're a wine geek like I am, you want to try it. You have to you, – you, you know enough about wine's history that you have to go to Croatia to taste what the beginning started like. Yeah, and it's, so it's that, a little, that's a niche for you, and I, and you and you should be willing to pay for that. Definitely. Well, thank you. Yes, and we are, and it's, but it's a little bit like being organic, right? That there's there's a penalty to it, which is that um, you know there's not a lot of consistency uh, to the to the process, and whereas a big importer uh, like you know Chambers and Chambers and these companies that do billions of cases, you know they've got a commitment from a winery for ten thousand cases every year. And they know it's going to taste the same, it's going to look the same, it's going to smell the same, it's going to be the same price. And so that's the easier route. But um, we, we actually don't like that, and we just the word blunt for punishment. We just thought we really want to bring wines from people who can't actually access the market. So anyway, it's been a blast. I, I, wait, wait till we bring the uh, Herzegovina wines. That'll make the Croatian wines look mainstream. There we um, go. I, I can't are. wait for that. I cannot wait. I so I have to taste the wines I got from you. I still I know, haven't you had a chance to taste them yet. Yeah. I, I have mine on a calendar of when I'm allowed to open the first bottle. <laughs> I'll tell you, you I just might have to Corvan it before I go to that Croatian tasting in the city. Yeah, it's Debbie and I are going to a Croatian tasting on the 26th. Oh, yeah, you're going to the – so, yes, there could be some great um, – People there, you guys know exotic wine travel, right? Matthew and Shireen that that, that wrote that book, Cracking Croatia, mm -hmm. um, Cracking Croatian Wine. They're going to be, um, they'll be there, and um, and then uh, Cliff Rames, who's the editor of Psalm Journal, who's also a 
a big expert on Croatian wine will also be there. So I, I think you guys will really enjoy that. I, I couldn't make it out there because I got two trips in New York coming up in the, uh, in the late spring. So I, I had to prioritize which one I could go to, but that, that should be a blast. That's awesome. I'm looking forward to it. I unfortunately can't be there till like the very tail end. Um, cause you know, got that day job that actually pays the bills. Um, but, uh, I'm, I'm heading, uh, I'll be there for like the last hour and a half of it. So okay. at least I'll get to taste. Um, so I'm just, is everybody ready for a riddle? I'm going to change sure, gears no here. Point. We ready for okay. a riddle? I'm curious. Where's your, who's where's, gonna... your, where's your Riddler costume? Oh, I should oh. get one. Next cut. That will be this, this mascot, right? <laughs> I've got Elmo for Wine from Bed Street, you know. Um, all right, so so here we go. Ready? It says, I can be quick and then I'm deadly. I am a rock, shell, and bone medley. If I was made into a man, I'd make people dream. I gather in millions by ocean, sea, and stream. Sam. Who said that? John did, I think. John, Nick, I think Nick, Nick. I think Nick and I tied. Ah, yeah. yes, sand, sand. All right. Good job, John. All right, Ooh. I would, I well, would you give you a full bottle yet. <laughs> you both a visual sign of what I feel right now for the fact that you guessed it so soon, but I don't want Lori to have to up the um. The yes, explicit. <laughs> but know that I'm sending you my. Willing hand gestures. <laughs> Two hands, I would guess, right? Yes, yeah. one for each of you. <laughs> Do, it like Do it like this. this, this yeah, yeah, as long as it's know. out of the camera <laughs> range. You know what, Jen? The answer is Robinson may be an MW, but let's see if she would get that answer correct. There yeah, you go. There you go. So, so what I was thinking is, um, you know, like, you always have to play a game. There's always got to be a game. Uh, so I was thinking the riddle and, uh, if you guys are willing to come back on, you know, whatever you guys can, I want to, you know, how Sunday night football always has, or Monday night football has the running tally of, you know, uh -huh. which announcers have won what. Um, so that's what I thought we, I would do. But if you guys are willing to sure, come back to another episode, I don't know. I got to get to 50%. Oh, yeah, Nick, can, uh, they both get a point? They I'm will assuming. both get a point. They will both get a point for this one because I, I, that was pretty much dead well, on at the same time. I'm not good at riddles, so I'll always have I'm a gonna, zero. Yeah, I'm going to suck at this, but I'm here, and I'm ready to well, go. Maybe we should be a team. <laughs> I don't oh, know that might be good. That might be good. But... I don't think I'm going to help much. <laughs> Sand. So, so yeah. Jeff, you're always really good at coming up with the, with your quote, uh, the, your movie quote, um, that, or, and your, you know, grape hop or pop that somewhat yeah. correlates to the people who come. Maybe I'll start being more, you know, as opposed to just Googling and pulling up the first <laughs> riddle that comes I'm up. I'm telling you, just, just Google and pull it up because after a while it gets to be so difficult. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So I want to thank everybody for coming. I had a blast and I hope you guys did too. And I just want to give you guys, you know, like a, you know, a minute to wrap up, you know, this is your time to, you know, promote yourselves, let everybody else know where they can find you, what you're doing, what you're looking forward to in this next week, whatever, you know, one minute in the spotlight. And I'm going to go the other way this time because, you know, that's the educator on me. You can't always pick the same person to go first, you know. So, Rick, that means it's you. I was afraid of that. Well, I really enjoyed being here tonight with everybody. Um, my blog is Strong Coffee to Red Wine, and my tagline is Powering Through the Day Drinking Coffee Until It's Acceptable to Drink Wine. And I don't know anybody who doesn't agree with that sentiment. <laughs> I agree with that one. Yes, it check me out at Strong Coffee to Red Wine. live that sentiment. <laughs> you can find me on Instagram at, at Coffee to Red Wine, on Twitter at, at Coffee to Red Wine. Lori, this was a blast. Thank you so much. Thank you. 
Nick? So I am at winecomguy um, on Instagram, Twitter. My blog is winecomguy uh, with WSET Diploma right now. There's a lot of drafts, so you're not going to find a lot of posts right now. Um, but yeah, uh, get in at winecomguy. And also when I'm not drinking this as in my everyday wine, it's probably Dracina, um you know, Cap Franc. Oh, I love you so oh, much. What a suck up. That's and, and, possibly, and possibly a Syrah Rosé. Oh, possibly. Oh, uh, see, and then you all wonder why I love Nick so much. Oh, <laughs> that is just got, he's just going for points. I was going to say, he wants bonus points. And Nick, this is what I have to say to you. I'm back up here. <laughs> <laughs> So, Nick, our next uh, House of Pendragon beer on me, buddy. Nice. John, what you got? Well, this really has been a blast. I actually follow all of you guys, um, so it's actually really cool to, to see everybody and talk to everybody. Um, I'm at Dumpachino Espino on uh, Twitter and Instagram. Um, our our uh, e-commerce wine site is dumpachinos.com. Anyone who wants to buy uh, wine, I'll give you a 15% discount, which is essentially most of our markup. Um, so if you put it in Friends 15, uh, you'll get a discount on our wines. Um, we just added uh, Marcus Wine from Lodi. We just added, we're about to add, we actually just added um, Aquias Wine from Lodi. We're about to add Bokish Wine uh, from Lodi. This weekend I'll put up Saf's Wine, which makes some incredible Pinot Blanc and Pinot Gris uh, from Oregon. And of course there's the Spanish and Italian and Croatian wines that we have on the site. Um, just really be curious and honored if you guys can buy some, taste it, let me know what you think. And anything you don't like, I'll, I'll refund your money. And that's how that's wow. confident I feel in the wine that we sell. Are you talking to just us or is this to anyone who's listening? <laughs> well, that's it. Anyone who's listening, can I'll, I'll stand by that offer. Okay. So, and I think you need to spell your website because it's such an interesting name. That, why don't you put it in the chat too? Well, oh, yeah. yeah. That's a great but, idea. You know, for the you know for the listeners, not the easiest to guess as right. you're typing. But it will right, be. So. You know what, John? I in the homepage notes um, for the podcast, I will put your link in there. And if you want to give me that coupon code again, I'll put that in there if you would like. And on the bottom of the YouTube video in the comments, I will put. Um, you know, I'll, all of your social media, all of your websites, I'll have That's a link great. to everybody's website in the on my homepage. Fantastic. Thank you, guys. Jeff? Oh, you want me now? Lean, lean right. in, Jeff. Lean in. All right. Here we, I, I like sitting back and just absorbing everything. That, so I'm going to get in podcast mode here, Lori. So hold on. Hold on. Uh, so you, join us every mm-hmm. Friday on the We Like Drinking podcast. You can find it on your favorite uh, podcast catcher app at we like drinking you can find us on facebook and instagram at we like drinking and on twitter Lori at we like drinking one why because some college punk kid 10 years ago grabbed <laughs> we like drinking has posted two times and has never posted again. I, I, I see you, and you, you make me angry. Uh, we drop every Friday morning. You can find the show. Uh, we have awesome guests. We've had Lori on the show, winemakers, beer makers, the whole gamut of the drinking universe that we have on the show. I think I'm going to get some of the people that are on this panel on here uh, on as well in the near future. Hint, hint. Uh, wink, wink to all of you that I'm looking at right now. Uh, and uh, yeah, that is where you can find the award-winning uh, We Like Drinking. Award-winning, award-winning. And you are also offering a special deal right now too. Absolutely. We got all kinds of cool stuff going on right now. If you ever have ever heard of EcoVessel, uh, they are a insulated uh, product for storing your water, storing your beer, storing your wine. We are giving away two 64-ounce 
growlers. Uh, and those come with an infuser, so you can put like lemon in your water. Uh, you can it, at, at, you can brew tea, you can brew coffee, you can do all kinds of stuff with that. You just you have live to in California, you can brew other right, stuff. So, wait a second, Jeff. I listened to that the other day when I was driving to work. Yeah, yeah. And I have a podcast player on my Samsung, so I'm not Apple, and I can't figure out how to write a review. Here's what you do, okay? Because I understand the Apple Podcast application is horrible if you don't have a Macintosh product. Here's what you do. You tweet us something that you like about the show, hashtag EcoVessel in it, I'll put you in it. Okay. All right. And just for the record, even those of us who are Apple, there are those of us that are technically challenged. <laughs> and I wrote your review, but I couldn't figure out all the other rules, and so you got the review, there's no Echo Vessel hashtag whatever the heck I was supposed to do, but I love your show, and so... So I was laughing it. because, yeah, Jeff, you kept it. saying, so Dean, 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 and I knew it was him. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. You're... You're in it to win it, and you're in it to win it. So everybody's in it to win it. So yes. yeah, uh, and also if you want to purchase an eco vessel, which uh, I did, if you, do, if you do, yes, you did, and I appreciate that so much. If you use WLD thirty, you get thirty percent off uh, your first order from them, and they've got some fantastic products. So definitely check that out. You can find it all at We Like Drinking. Dot com where, where you you'll never drink, drink alone. alone. <laughs> Me and Lois, thank you. <laughs> As you can tell, I don't listen to them at all. Not at all. I, I got a lot of a little excited there. I'm sorry. I even was telling the lady, the photographer that's hanging her stuff at the restaurant about the wine bottle thing yeah. for the beach. Yeah. Oh. Go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I don't have it in here. Usually I have it in here, but it's also a 750 milliliter yeah. uh, bottle shaped like a wine bottle. It comes with a funnel. Comes with a funnel. I love that. Yeah. Collapsible comes funnel. Comes with a cl collapsible silicone <laughs> funnel. Uh, it comes with a cleaner that you can pour a whole bottle into it. Keeps it keeps it at temperature for 36 hours. It's, a, it's crazy. Yeah. There is so much wrong with that description. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> But I shouldn't. I shouldn't be asking. I shouldn't be asking people to to uh, write the review for you, Jeff, because that's just lowering my chances of winning the Echo Vessel. Okay, write one for Lori as well. <laughs> All right, Debbie, you are up. All right, I am the Hudson Valley Wine Goddess, and you can find me online at HudsonValleyWineGoddess.com and on Facebook, Hudson Valley Wine Goddess, and I'm HV Wine Goddess on Instagram. Uh, Twitter and YouTube, and um, I really love this stuff. It's like I get off these type of programs, and it's like I don't know who I am. I'm like, where is everybody? <laughs> um, so thank you for inviting me. And um, if you're looking for um, Tapping the Hudson Valley, if you're going to visit the Hudson Valley anytime in the near future, go to tappingthehudsonvalley.com, and you can uh, look in and purchase uh, my book. It's one and three day itinerary visiting the craft beverage producers and the sites along the way. And since so. Debbie does the calendar, when is our next episode of Wine for Bed Street? Next Monday. It's next Monday. <laughs> next Monday. Next so, Monday, eight o'clock. It's the nineteenth, right? Yeah. Yeah. 12, so twelve and seven is the nineteenth. Okay. So I need another snow day so I can work a little more. Yeah. <laughs> Are we on? Um, are we on J? We yeah, are on J. Jakir, I think it's Jakir. Jakir. Right, Nick? Yeah. Did I say that right? Um, yeah. And I was still my favorite. So, everybody, like this is Nick. This is how we got Itata. Thanks to Nick. Because I had no clue what an I would be. And, like, <laughs> boom. After an entire day of drinking at the Wine Bloggers Conference, he blew, he's like, I, Itata. Well, you're like, I said, well, what about ice wine? I'm not doing ice wine. <laughs> well, yeah, I well, that. Fine, let's. Well, because actually that starts with an E. Hey, not. <laughs> not to the general that's populace. True. No, that's true. E-I-S-W-E. Yep. Ice, mm -hmm. sure, ice wine. 
But if you're in the States, ice wine. Right. Yep. Yeah, no, 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 no. I've seen, <laughs> I'm not going to lie, I've seen Finger Lakes, I've seen Finger Lake <laughs> labels that have it ICE. So. Yeah, that's just for the U.S. market. Yes. Well, that's what, yeah. <laughs> well, they have it in Canada, too, I think, that way, too. In um, Ontario. Yeah. But just, I, I was so impressed. After a day of drinking, bam, just like that. And I, of course, went home and we joked because I told Debbie, oh, Nick came up with Itata. It's Italy. <laughs> yeah, and, I, and I, I Googled it. I'm like, Mary, it's Chile. <laughs> Are you sure? It's Italy because I Googled it. it came Come on. Itata. It right. sounds like it oh. should be Italy. <laughs> hey, Lori. Yes, I would like to thank you all for coming, and I am planning the next episode to be April 23rd, so if you can check into your calendars and see if that works for you, um, and if you guys have suggestions of what topics you want to talk about, uh, I totally would appreciate it. And Jeff, if you can give me Google Hangout lessons, I totally appreciate that. Um, you know, uh, let but, me know when you have your next snow day. Okay, yeah. probably tomorrow. <laughs> probably tomorrow. But so anyway, thank you very much for joining, and I hope you all can come back on the twenty third. And please shoot me an email. Um, let me know what links you would like me to put on the homepage of if there's anything else other than your websites and your blogs or whatever that you would like. Um, but I totally appreciate talking to you and I had a blast. I hope you guys did too. Thank you so much. Fun. I did. Cheers, everyone. Slancha. Slancha, have, have a great Bye. night, yeah. guys. Good night. Cheers, everyone. Night. Bye. 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 Thanks for listening to Dracina Wines Podcast. If you have suggestions of what topics you would like us to discuss, please reach out to us on social media or at dracinawines at gmail.com. If you liked our podcast, please subscribe at iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, or whichever podcasting program you use. To easily subscribe at iTunes, please go to bit.ly forward slash Dracina Podcast. That's B-I-T dot L-Y forward slash capital D for Dracina and capital P for podcast. We would greatly appreciate you leaving a review on your favorite system. It helps others to find us. Let's get social. Find us on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, Snapchat, Pinterest, YouTube, Google Plus, and Periscope at, at Dracina Wine. And I am on LinkedIn as Lori Hoyt Bud. Check out our award-winning wine at tracinawines.com. And remember to always pursue your passion. Slancha.